He would commit murders, he would torture people, he would extort money from them. One of the most violent criminals that Australia has ever seen. Look, he was just a young Albanian kid. He used to want to be a gangster. He was living the dream there for a while. He made enough money to start living the dream. Very few of them live to die of old age. They are either shot in an exchange of fire with police, or, as often as not, they're bumped off by their own rivals. This is the story of Nikolai Radev, nicknamed the Russian. And Dino Dibra, a founding member of the notorious Sunshine Crew. They both dreamt of ruling the underworld with their friends. But in the end, it was their mates who did them in. In this episode of Suburban Gangsters, we explore the life and crimes of Dino Dibra, a baby-faced drug dealer and murderer, and Nikolai Radev. He was a rapist, killer, extortionist and drug trafficker, a migrant who fouled his new country with callous brutality. This is Nikolai Radev in full spitting fury during a police interview. He was a violent psychopath nicknamed the Russian, although he was Bulgarian. He'd lived other lives under other names in places where brutality was the norm. Prior to the arrival of uh, Nick Radev, there was I suppose honour amongst thieves is a little too strong a term, but there was almost a set of rules. Uh, and you, uh, you didn't touch a person's family, by and large. That went out the window with Nick Radev. He brought with him a model of criminal behaviour that we hadn't seen on a wide-ranging scale, uh, certainly in Victoria before and probably anywhere in Australia. Uh, so he set a new high watermark in uh, criminal behaviour. In 1998, Les Papadopoulos was at his Northcote home when he says Nick Radev and two other men bound and gagged his parents, wife and five-year-old daughter, then ransacked the house. He went up to her, he stuck the uh, gun on the temple and he banded against uh, the money for your daughter. Nick Radev was a criminal all-rounder. He'd get involved in anything. But what gave him his edge, I think, was that people uh, suspected he would go beyond the pale in terms of violence. He was truly uh, uninhibited by any kind of conscience or morality and therefore created fear in those that did business with him. Uh, so that was his calling card and it ended up being his epitaph also. Radev learnt the power of violence as a child. He was born into Soviet-controlled Bulgaria in 1959. It was a time when the secret police controlled the population through fear. Looking after number one would be his primary lesson. Distrusting authority, knowing that authority can be capricious and brutal, and that therefore to survive or to even flourish, you have to be able to undermine a system that's more corrupt than you. Greco-Roman wrestlers, on the other hand, were the pride of the nation. Bulgaria dominated the sport on the world stage, and the athletes brought glory to the communist country. They were sponsored by the state and lived lavishly compared to their comrades. Radev was a champion wrestler, but he wasn't interested in bringing glory to Bulgaria. That type of sport is about control of violence. Now, it's interesting that he has harnessed that controlled violence 
to use perhaps in a more uncontrolled fashion. So that, I suppose, is where he has betrayed the, the code of sport in order to service his own ends. And that, I suppose, is, is where the psychopathic trade comes in as well, that he's betrayed his sport. And Radev definitely betrayed his sport, as his time in Bulgarian jail detailed. His history in Bulgaria is sketchy, but there's information to see that he did some time in the Soviet-style jail in Bulgaria, which wouldn't have been too comfortable. Nick Radev had been jailed for a number of violent crimes, violent assaults. Uh, we believe there's a rape there as well. Uh, and he had been involved in armed robberies and extortion. In 1981, Radev fled to Australia. Nick Radev arrived in Australia as a political refugee, but he's not the Dalai Lama. He was a violent criminal in Bulgaria, and by some means, he was able to clean his record. It's believed that Radev's criminal history was withheld from Australian authorities through corrupt influence from the Russian Mafia. Radev had developed contacts with the Russian Mafia while he was in jail in Bulgaria. The largest uh, Russian crime group is Dolgo Proadnanskaya. Uh, to give you an idea of their scope, uh, in the United States Mafia, there are approximately 800 made men. Uh, in Dolgo Proadnanskaya, there are 8,000 active members. So 10 times the size of the US Mafia and they are literally into everything. And Radev was their, essentially their Melbourne contact. On a refugee visa, Radev's future in Australia was limited, so he needed a wife. He seduced a 16-year-old hairdresser named Sylvia and persuaded her to marry him. People say he was a very charming man. It's a real paradox, this contrast between this very charming, urbane almost, uh, European man, um, and this uh, cold psychopath uh, killer, uh, on the other hand. And uh, he was always popular with women, as many of these guys are. And uh, I think Sylvia fell for his charms, and, and uh, it, to, to him, she was useful. She believed that he married her because of her, you know, his ability to become an Australian citizen. That's probably true, but at the same time, she provided for him a front. There's nothing more acceptable, nothing more middle class in Australia than having a wife and a child. Instead of showing her gratitude, Radev violently abused her. He subjected her to years of torture and abuse. She was terrified that, that if she left him, that, that it would, it would, uh, she would be murdered and other people around her would be, be murdered. Uh, so she was in a, in a terrifying ordeal for years uh, while, uh, while he continued his, his uh, you know, crime spree. Radev racked up convictions for assault and drug trafficking, which landed him in jail. After Bulgarian prisons, it must have seemed like a holiday resort, just a place to expand his network and learn of the opportunities that awaited him upon his release. He emerged with a cold-hearted plan. Ivan Solikov was a hard-working, honest immigrant, worked in a, in a car factory, um, and one day he just never turned up for work. His bank accounts remained untouched. No one knew where he went. He just basically disappeared off the face of the earth. From that moment on, if police questioned him, Radev would say his name was Ivan Solokov. Radev would appear in court. The record would develop against Solokov's name, not his own, and, uh, and keeping Radev's criminal convictions, criminal past, criminal history, essentially clean. And it is believed that Radev basically killed him to steal his identity. It would be several years before the police unravelled his deception. While Nikolai Radev was establishing his reputation as one of Melbourne's most feared criminals, a young kid called Dino Dibra 
was dreaming of becoming a gangster. Just like he'd seen in the movies. Everyone saw Scarface. They all saw Scarface, the movie. Everyone pretended they were Tony Montana. Dino Dibber lived a fantasy life. He was very much entrenched in um, action movies and he tried to emulate his celluloid heroes in real life. Dino was born in 1975 to an Albanian family and grew up in Melbourne's multicultural suburb of Sunshine. Well, that whole area came out of the multicultural experiment of the 70s. They were born into this, where people were encouraged to keep their own languages and customs and, and social events and festivals and so forth. There wasn't any pressure to conform to become part of the broader Australian uh, nation, you know. So they, they grew up there. Often their parents didn't speak very good English. Um, Dino's parents certainly didn't. I've met them and they, they struggled a bit with English and so forth. So you have these situations where these boys run the household. Whenever there's any issue with authority or, or officialdom, the boys would handle it because they got the better English and they can deal with it. So that they, they, they grew up very quickly and they, they assumed what they saw as manly, dominant roles much earlier than, than boys from other families with a, a strong English background, for instance. The factory jobs that had brought families to these areas began to disappear from the 1970s. Kids left school early, working to support their families. But Dino and his mates found easier ways through crime. The Sunshine Boys were on a fast track to the big time, ambitions that were fed by gangster movies and tabloid headlines. It was a gang of schoolmates, but the core was Dibra, Mark Malia, who went on to work for Nick Radev, and Andrew Benji Venyaman. Venyaman would end up working for almost everyone. But what bound them, at least for a time, was the leadership of a man named Paul Kalapolitis. Kalapolitis was trained in martial arts. He was a ferocious fighter, uh, a very violent human being. Um, and it was he who basically set in train, if you like, established the apprenticeships for these very serious criminal figures. And he was getting involved in hydroponic marijuana, uh, car rebirthing, different things like that. And these boys were willing helpers to that and, and they idolised him. He was a very tough guy. I guess it must have seemed almost like innocent fun at, at times. Fights at school, you know. When they were all in school together, they were involved in crime. But they'd walk into the classroom in designer tracksuits with big chunky gold necklaces. The teacher would say, well, you'll never amount to anything. They'd say, well, we already are. We're already on our way. We're gonna be the biggest team and you watch us. As the years went by, but still as teenagers, they were involved in basically setting up hydroponic cannabis growing in homes. They basically demand that people make their houses available. They routinely take $40,000 a year out of a house that was just growing pot. The thing about crime back in the suburbs then was that it was based largely around amphetamines and hydroponic marijuana. Neither of these drugs required a lot of international connections or now so you could do it from recipes from the internet or locally available resources. But it made people feel like they could be a big shot too. Why did they have to listen to somebody who was telling them what to do when they could do the same thing? If you had a supply of, of pseudoephedrine or, or seed for cannabis, a gun down your pants, you could be a big shot too. And Dino was, was convinced that he would be the biggest shot of them all. Chopper Reed had a unique perspective on how to deal with a problem like Dibra. You see a young kid getting around, you see a 16 year old kid getting around with gold chains and a handgun, you shoot him. You don't let him become 17. You know, <laughs> not if you've got a loaded handgun and he's 16, he's getting, walking around swinging it around the place, well, you go pop. You know, it doesn't matter that he's 16, it's too bad for you. You know, you don't let him become 17. Yeah. Dibra felt bulletproof and lived recklessly. Imbued with the arrogance of youth, he would stop at nothing to become Melbourne's biggest gangster.
While Nick Radev was enjoying his reputation as one of Melbourne's most sadistic criminals, Dino Dibra was building a successful drug business. Melbourne had become the party drug capital of Australia. Faced with a tidal wave of ecstasy, the cops couldn't cope. What's interesting about Radev and Dibra is that they're operating in an area where there's very little police presence and not much kind of preventative law going on out there. So they get cocky. They're very rarely arrested. No one tries to stop them doing it. Then maybe some money changing hands. And ultimately, they're not being chased down by the police. When push comes to shove, their heads are getting bigger and bigger and bigger. In fact, they probably got too big for their britches. And in the end, it's them. It's the crooks that are running the show and then taking each other out as things get a little bit competitive. The advent of hard drugs in Melbourne's underworld changed the way business was done from the mid-70s. There had been rules and conventions among the old crooks, and a kind of order was maintained back then. Drugs brought anarchy. Drugs were becoming bigger and bigger and bigger. We were SP bookmakers. Uh, we were fences. We were things like that. We weren't doing drugs. But uh, the younger gang got into drugs, so, well, uh, things became a hell of a lot more messed up then. They were vicious. They had no scruples. And uh, that's where I think the old gang, there's not too many left, there's probably me, a couple of the Carlton ones. We didn't see the writing on the wall. The Sunshine Boys were headed uptown and graduated from marijuana to harder drugs. They were mixing with heavy Melbourne crims in nightclubs and Dibra began hanging around with Alphonse Gangitano, boss of the feared Carlton crew. Young men like Dibra queued up for a chance to be seen with them. Dino Dibra I first met up in Carlton. He used to knock around with Alphonse and his entourage. He was being used by them to do a lot of their dirty work. He wanted to uh, ingratiate himself with the Carlton crew. Uh, but me, at that time, it was uh, Alphonse and his stooges. And um, uh, he thought to become a part of it, he would uh, practically do anything for them. And they paid him a wage every now and then, and uh, he was quite happy with that. And he'd go back to the western suburbs and tell them all how lucky he was to be a friend of, Al of Alphonse's. Things were going well until Dino's ego, fueled by heavy cocaine use, destroyed the trust between him and Benji. It began over a car they stole together. A simple job, steal a car for a friend in the rebirthing racket. Rebirthing involves buying a wreck at auction, then stealing an identical vehicle to cannibalise for parts. The wreck would then be miraculously reborn. Benji and Dino were asked to fill an order for a car rebirthing operation for a VN Calais Holden. Um, they found one in Port Melbourne, they stole it, not realising it was actually an off-duty policeman's car, which had a, a laptop computer in the boot, which had lots and lots of sensitive information in there about informers, about operations, about all sorts of, even, even home addresses of various police. And um, um, Benji was all for selling it to the, uh, to the uh, Carlton crew, because this would be useful information for, you know, for gangsters who wanted to know about police. But Dino, no, no, Dino wanted to make a big scene. He wanted to make a big show. So they got the address of a prominent undercover police officer and drove past his house one day. The family was out there in the front yard and so forth, and they waved to this copper, slow royal wave, and that was the beginning of the end of their relationship. From there, they were picked up. They were put in the cell with another man who Dino began to boast about what they'd done. Uh, he was, in fact, an undercover policeman or informer, so they were busted. When Dino received a shorter prison sentence than Benji, the gang suspected he'd ratted them out. So this was now a great wedge between the group. And they had sworn that they were going to be the biggest team 
in Australia, but now it was going to be uh, poisonous. This toxic environment just got worse and worse. Dino wasn't as bright as the other members of the gang, and Dino was unfortunately um, may have been used by some local police officers to get information, and Dino was never seen to be very bright. But the difficulty arises as soon as one gang member thinks that Dino, for example, is, is, is giving information in return for a softer sentence or, or no prosecution, the trust is gone. Benji decided he had to do something about Dino. And he said to Deborah, well, you're a dog, you know, you've lagged us, you have to pay the price now. They shot him twice in the leg, breaking in his left leg. Others on the scene urged Benji to kill him at that moment. But he wouldn't do it because the bonds of friendship were still there. Compassion was not one of Radev's strong suits. He was not subtle and would crush any human spirit and body to get what he wanted. One of the things that he rose to fame over, if you could call it fame, is uh, Radev one evening went to the house of a uh, man that had been selling drugs on his behalf. Uh, There's several thousand dollars owed. I believe that he was told that there was no money and there's not much likelihood of getting any money. And Radev, at gunpoint, made the man strip in front of his wife and family. And in front of his wife and children, he sodomised his wife. That is just gross and terrifying humiliation of a really nasty kind. And it is so deliberate and so, so awful that uh, he obviously knows exactly what he's doing. And he's not just humiliating the guy. What he's doing is actually destroying the family. Radev's time in a Bulgarian prison had made him hardened to violence. It also taught him how to prey on the vulnerable, which he did during a stretch in a Victorian prison in 1998. He went to jail under suspicion of being a, a person who had killed police. And unfortunately, those persons uh, are treated um, with a little bit of regard in prison, which is a disgrace. Turkish-born Sadat Salan was a businessman and fraudster, and it was his first time inside. Sadat Selan would be about 50 kilograms ringing wet. Nick met Sadat Selan, who was an inferior, weak person in jail, and offered him protection. But in reply for that protection, Sadat had to arrange money to be paid to Nick Radev and his cohorts. Once he left prison, Sadat thought that that would all be over, that he's out, he's at his protection, but it didn't stop. If Nick Radev picked a target, and his targets would normally be weaker than him, he would terrorise them, he would threaten them with death, put guns in their mouths, and uh, he would bleed them dry. On one occasion, Radev invited his old mate Salan to discuss business at the Stamford Plaza Hotel. From the moment he entered the room, he was punched, kicked, and held against his will for up to eight hours. A figure of $120,000 was put to him uh, in relation to a blackmail, and he was held there until he promised that he could actually provide that money. And that's what led to him fleeing the country and hiding in Turkey to protect his own safety, because he was of the belief that he was going back to prison and he wouldn't be able to be protected in there by the police. As a cop, Ben Archbold's job was to pursue Radev, but he would be the one needing protection. Like Sadat Salan, Archbold would soon experience the consequences of dealing with Nikolai Radev. Nick Radev had threatened to kill his former prison buddy, Sadat Salan, unless he paid him $120,000. When Radev arrived at Salan's house, he found the worm had turned. Salan pulled a gun and opened fire. He missed and Radev fled. The shooting triggered a chain of events former detective Ben Archbold could never have predicted. We were listening for the blackmail of uh, Sadat Selan, 
Uh, we also arrested him for possessing a firearm, a pistol, and he was very violent during the arrest. He had to be actually physically restrained. Uh, he was put in handcuffs and put a, a bag was put over his head. So after the members of the Special Operation Group arrested him, he was brought back to St Kilda Road Police Station. He was hooded at the time. Um, his hood was removed, and this is what I encountered. This is Nick Radev. Well, and Nikolai Radev. A bad ball, tell me how he's gonna kill me! I'm in this fucking country! And then he's gonna kill me, and he's gonna do me this, he's gonna do me that! Come on, you mother! Come on, do me! You wanna fucking kill me? You promise me how you're gonna kill me? And I'm your fucking country? Eh? Good. Do it. We dogs. We dog! Come on, hit me! Come on! Come on! Do it! Where do you fuck me, dog? You fuck your whole life! Yeah, come on, do it! Do it! The pivotal moment in the interview came when Archbold revealed the findings of his investigation. Nikolai Radev, when he was arrested, was arrested for very big offences and he was using the name Ivan Solokov. Prior convictions were not actually being attributed to his criminal antecedents. So he was able to remain in Australia, commit crimes, get arrested, get charged, get convicted at court, but accrue no criminal records under his own identity, and that was Nikolai Radev. Despite the incriminating evidence, Radev was released. Fearing deportation, he went on the warpath. Radev has gone completely berserk. The hatred for this policeman that interviewed him, and he, whom he had tried to humiliate in the interview room. He'd become obsessed with revenge. Radev then decided to take matters into his own hands and try and scare him off by threatening to kill him. He put the feelers out to find out where Ben Archbold lived. We believe a corrupt member of the Victorian police force sold Ben Archbold's home address for $30,000 in a strip club to Nick Radev. He was looking for me and he wanted to kill me. There was no doubt about that. I had been um, moving my address from hotel to hotel, been carrying my firearm 24 hours a day and it had really disturbed my life. Things escalated even further when Radev appeared at Archbold's parents' hotel, the Bush Inn in Turak. And the suggestion is, from a listening device, that he was in possession of a hand grenade at the time. He asked my father uh, whether I was there. Uh, no, he wasn't aggressive to me, he was just probably arrogant. You know, just, just take him as another punter who having trouble getting on or whatever. And in the middle of the conversation, he just said, oh, you're not Ben's dad, are you? And I said, no, Ben who? So, coming to the family hotel there with a hand grenade, it's a fairly unambiguous statement. I might take everyone out here. Doesn't matter, but I'll, but I'll get Ben Archbold. So, you know, Ben had to go into hiding. Uh, his family sold the hotel. They had to move away. Um, it really shattered their lives forever. And I think there's a trail of families that Nick Radev touched in similar ways. Don't think Radev was ever charged with anything in relation to the, uh, the threats to kill. Radev, as a result of that, went on for a further three or four years because of his reputation. Everybody knew about it, and it made him bigger in the eyes of the scumbags that he was running around with. Radev was seemingly untouchable, and with Ben Archbold in hiding, he was free to continue his reign of terror. Dino's problems commence with the breakdown of the gang. He then moves into drug distribution and amphetamines because he can make more money. Dino becomes taken with the same myth that's portrayed in the movie Scarface, where he is the immigrant kid who is now this big crime lord. And he starts to build relationships with gangsters who have real credentials, real street credentials, the Radevs and the Williamses. But in, but in essence, 
those people are using him for what he provides, and that is a distribution point. He thinks that he has a status in this big gang, and unfortunately, he is simply just being used. Carl Williams was one of the city's biggest players at the time and was about to go to war with the powerful Moran faction. His former partners had become enemies. Carl needed muscle like Dino to do things he couldn't. Carl Williams, he was, he was just a fat, wobbly bottom boy from bloody Broad Meadows, you know. Uh, see, Jason Moran put this idiot in charge of his own uh, ecstasy chemicals and, and pill press, right? and taught him how to operate it and use the, use the chemicals and make ecstasy. He's taught this complete wombat how to do this, right? And then, and then when someone else was coming up with this, this um, really top-class ecstasy uh, with, a, with a new stamp on the top, he's wondering, well, who, who's making this? Who's making this? And he was only making um, Jason Rand's stuff for two days a week and he was making his own stuff for the other two days a week, you know? And... Uh, Jason Moran couldn't figure it out. Dibra began dealing for Williams in the city's nightclubs, but he sampled the product too much and made a habit of creating violent scenes in public. A night out with Dino could turn ugly in a heartbeat. Then there was an incident in late 1988 at a nightclub called The Dome, where he and his group were refused entry. So one of the groups produced a handgun. They've started a wild affray. Popped two bouncers at close range. Miraculously didn't kill them. I think one bouncer copped a round in the leg. Another bouncer copped a round in his abdomen. By the time he was 20, Dibra had amassed convictions for drugs, car rebirthing, theft, extortion and assaulting police. Let's not forget, Dino Dibra had an IQ of 87. That's basically below par intelligence. So, you know, he didn't, he wasn't a deep thinker. He didn't understand the world beyond his little uh, life of cause and effect. So, and he wanted to experience the, the thrill of being somebody, being a big shot, uh, handling a gun, shooting people, um, graduating to murder. This is, this is the career path of someone like Dino Dibra. And uh, it was always gonna happen. And that did happen when Dibra was believed to be the killer of notorious underworld figure, Mad Charlie Haglaji. It's an absolute fluke that he was clever enough to sneak a Mad Charlie. Because if Charlie had of, Charlie would have filled him full of lead had he had a seconds drop on him, you know? Well, he developed his nickname, Mad Charlie, after biting someone's nose off in a fight when he was a younger man. If basically someone challenged him, he would produce a gun, he would shoot that person. He was extremely violent and had that reputation amongst the criminal underworld in Melbourne. So when Dino Dibra came across Mad Charlie, there was only one way it was going to end. Either Mad Charlie was going to shoot Dino, or Dino was going to shoot Mad Charlie. It's believed the murder stemmed from a drug debt. And when two highly volatile individuals like Dibra and Heglaji were involved, it was only going to end one way. Yeah, Mad Charlie lost the plot. I mean, he was old school. But once these old school guys start ripping into the drugs, uh, they lose perspective. His house was very secure, very fortified. Someone still managed to lie in wait and ambush him as he arrived home that night. He received several shots to the head and died on his pathway where I think his wife saw him in their video monitor when she awoke the next morning. At 23, Dino had made his first kill. It would get easier now. It was a time of ambushes and preemptive strikes. High on coke, he would brag to his sunshine mates about all the people he was going to kill. He did not know that his own killer was standing right next to him. In 1999, after three years of bad blood, Dino settled his differences with his best mate, Benji. 
They went into business and created a cannabis cartel. For a time, they ruled the streets of Melbourne's western suburbs. But all the while, Dino was becoming more paranoid, more unpredictable, more deranged. The word from police sources is that Dino was, was fueled on speed, cocaine, and he was um, pumping a lot of juice into him, like steroids. But steroids, obviously, uh, mixed with that sort of volatile cocktail of drugs, just exacerbated his whole maniacal personality, if you like. So, I mean, he was a walking time bomb. He was on the coke, he was full of bravado, full of confidence, he would say anything, do anything. There were incidents where he was on the coke, he would get police officers to chase him just for the fun of it, you know? This started to push these guys apart as well, that, uh, that Benji could no longer afford to have a guy like Dino around. In a moment of madness, Dibra decided to kidnap 23-year-old standover man, Richard Maladnich. What drugs was Dibra taken to told him that, that there was any money involved in Maladovich? If you're going to kidnap anyone on, on earth, why would you kidnap Richard Maladovich? You know? I mean, this, this was amateur hour, this kidnap. It, and it showed exactly what sort of uh, clowns and maniacs these guys were. I mean, they've kidnapped this guy in, in broad daylight. During a police investigation into the shooting of two bouncers at the Dome nightclub in 1998, detectives had a Taylor's Lakes house bugged. But as the covert officers watched and listened, they stumbled across another crime taking place, a kidnap and ransom. The 23-year-old victim was abducted from sunshine in broad daylight, beaten and pistol whipped before being thrown into the boot of a car. The court heard he managed to jump out of the moving car after activating the emergency release catch. But his attackers recaptured the man. Uh, and they get him back to Dino's house and they think, well, what do we do with him now? We've, what do they do in the movies? Oh, well, they ring up and they ransom him for, you know, let, let's start with 20,000. Yeah, that, that seems a reasonable amount. When they get no joy, they bring it down and down, suddenly it's 5,000, you know? He's went ring up Jason Rand and says he wanted, he wanted five grand for, for Richard Miletovich. And, and he said, what? He said, you want me to give you five grand for Richard Miletovich? He says, I'll, I'll give you five grand if you kill him. <laughs> he says, I'll give you five grand if you take him somewhere and kill him. And in the end, the, the police have actually been monitoring this whole situation and stormed the place and poor old Miletovich is there and, and he gets released and the whole thing is a complete joke. So, you know. It was to be no laughing matter for Maladnich, who was allegedly killed by Dibra and his associates in May 2000. One of 30 murders that rocked the city in the deadly turf war, Richard Maladnich was shot dead in St Kilda's Esquire Motel on May 16, 2000. Paranoia and fear were consuming everyone, and the body count began to soar. Dibra's best mate, Benji Venyaman, was also becoming a prolific executioner. Look, Benji Veneman, he was, uh, if he was an inch shorter, he made a good circus dwarf. He was a, he was a two bob little flea. He was on Carl Williams' side one day, he was on uh, Mick Gatto's side the next. He, he couldn't make up what side of the fence he was on, you know? In 2000, it was decided that Dibra had to go. He was becoming a threat to all. He had to be taken out, but he wouldn't be an easy target. So his inner circle served him up to the killers. He had a, uh, a shack over in Cranbrook Street, Sunshine West, which uh, was known only to his close associates. But uh, by this time, he had quite a few enemies and he double-crossed quite a few people in his circle who may have tipped off the assassins to um, his presence at the house. In October 2000, 25-year-old convicted drug trafficker Dino Dibra was gunned down execution style outside a house in Cambrook Street, West Sunshine. Police believe there were three killers. They say they know one of the gunmen, but need more information to arrest him. 
we believe we know the identity of uh, one of the gunmen. We're confident that this gunman is in fact a uh, hired hitman. Dibra's grieving family also appealed for more information. Anyone that has any information, please come forward. That's all we ask. You have to put yourself in our position. We need some sort of closure. Dino Dibra was ambushed outside a house in West Sunshine. He was riddled with bullets by what are believed to be two gunmen, one of those gunmen being Andrew Venom. All these issues that had begun years ago in petty personal disputes were now being played out in murder. It was the total disaster and, and destruction of, of the little team. After Deborah's death, Benji turned on other members of the Sunshine Boys. In 2002, he was the prime suspect in Paul Kalapolitis's murder. In 2003, he was involved in the abduction, torture and killing of Mark Malia. In 2004, Benji himself was finally killed by his former friend Mick Gatto in self-defence. For a gang whose ties were forged in blood, it was a befitting end for Scarface in the suburbs. Meanwhile, Radev continued with his tried and tested extortion techniques. His, his area of expertise would be that he would set up a drug deal and assume or let that person believe that he had drugs to sell. The person would rock up with a whole heap of money. He would then just extort the money from him, take the money. There was never any drugs. He would just take the money, do the rip and get rid of him. I mean, as if that person is going to go to the police and report the fact they were there trying to buy $500,000 worth of drugs. It just doesn't happen. Like Dibra, Radev thought it would be a good idea to go into business with Carl Williams. Carl by now was, was well established in the manufacture of amphetamines, had good connections. He was a very good businessman in this area, if you like. People trusted him, and therefore he was doing business with a range of people. Radev was a quarrelsome, difficult person to deal with in this business, um, but he was, he was taking lots of product. So Carl and his, I guess, greed and naivety kept doing business with him. Carl Williams and Nick Radev had a, had a relationship, but it was one based, it was a very awkward one. Williams was fearful of Radev. By 2003, Radev was at the centre of drug operations in Melbourne and business was booming. The demand for amphetamines and ecstasy had created a latter-day gold rush. Carl Williams still controlled the amphetamine trade, courtesy of his connections for precursor chemicals and a gifted speed cook who produced excellent product. As William's empire expanded, Radev endeavoured to expand his own empire, but he just did not have uh, the ability because violence, although it might have been the short-term answer, it was not the long-term solution in relation to his network building. And he just didn't have the uh, ability. He could stand over and he would kill people, but he just couldn't kill enough people to be able to take over the William's empire. There was an increasing level of tension in their relationship. Radev was continually complaining about the quality of speed that was coming out of Carl. He wanted to meet the cook to have this out and discuss the recipe. You know, he wouldn't have known you know, two things about how to make a, uh, you know, a batch of speed, but this was the underlying plan, that he, he planned to rip everything off. Radev's plan was always to find out who the speed cook was, where he was, and come and kidnap him and make him work only for Nick Radev. And of course, this uh, wouldn't have made other people very happy, uh, given how, how good George was at, at, at what he did and so forth. So this was really the beginning of the end for Nick Radev. Nick Radev had a long and violent criminal past. He lived by the sword and last night he died by the sword. As he approached his black Mercedes in Queen Street, Coburg, a gunman fired at least seven shots, one hitting Radev in the head. He died instantly, two friends ran off, one escaping in a taxi. Radev was yet another casualty of Melbourne's long and bloody gang wars. It's believed that Carl Williams ordered the hit and that Benji Venyaman had reprised his role as executioner to ice Radev, just as he had his old friend Dino. 
Benji and Williams eventually met their own violent ends. As they say in the Melbourne underworld, we catch and kill our own 